we typically mm -hmm. not. Uh, we've had trouble with, uh, you know, getting a stable connection. So, yeah, it's it's not really adequate. And the other key thing is, whoever is going to host the simulcast, they have to have a decent computer. Yeah, because yeah. it takes a lot of bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, you're broadcasting and receiving at the same time and to multiple sources. We'll have to see if we can, yeah, maybe do some, you know, assuming we're we're going back there in person. And I'll just maybe for Reg's benefit there, we're just talking about a potential to resume in person Astro Cafe at some point and our discussions that we might want to hold with. Uh, so John's going to talk to the uh, Fairfield Gonzalez Community Association. I mean, yeah, a simple, yeah, yeah, a yeah, simple yeah. way to do it actually is, is just to use um, a cell phone um, similar to what I did at the meeting. Yeah. Um, you can bring Zoom up on a cell phone and uh, just sort of wave it around. It and it it would work. It wouldn't be professional looking, but it would yeah. work. But that's predicated on having a good uh, Wi-Fi connection. Yeah, and which we again has been rather iffy there. So we don't know if Fairfield Community Center is going to be available this. This, this is true. <laughs> so that's the first part of the conversation that John will have with them to say, are they prepared to welcome us back? And then if they are, uh, what we might want to have going forward. But I would say that's still quite a long, you know, it, I mean, it's getting closer to being possible, but I think it's, you know, in terms of organizing and stuff, it's still a, long, a fairly long way off as to whether we, it might actually we could. We could try it, like do a do a trial with just a yeah. few people in a room or something like that. I, I think we'd need to, yeah, and see what we can make work because yeah, see what yeah, see what it would take to make it happen. Because uh, we're thinking it's probably going to be a room occupancy level that's you know we've typically exceeded in the past, so I think it certainly uh, becomes a an issue to have um, you know the ability to attend over Zoom. So. Same issue in spades for uh, our UVic meeting, monthly meeting. Yeah, I'll mm -hmm. take that bit on too, as I'm still uh, still technically an employee for another uh, 19 days, and uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> then I get to retire again, and um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So I'll uh, check because it, uh, it's within the office. So I'll just see what their uh, what the plans are for September, and then we can sort of look at what we might want to do. I see Dave Payne here. Dave, it's John. I just want to say um, I've done another version of your uh, data, Im an image with your data. Uh, it's not a lot different, but I what I did is I processed the the narrow band data completely separately. Oh yeah, getting a getting a uh, color image with just narrow band, and then use the nebula part of it uh, in the image. I don't know if it's better or worse. It's just a little different. Oh, did you did you put it in? Uh, I in I the... haven't yet. I mean, I oh. can show it to you if you want tonight, but. It, you might want to show this stuff yourself later, so I, I will hold off. Oh, I'd love to see it. Okay, well, I can show it later. Uh, Chris, that means yeah. let me have a, a minute to show. Sure. Dave can do the talking, but I'll, I'll show stuff. That's <laughs> right, put that on the list there. Um, well, actually, while we're on that note, does anybody else have um, anything? I have um, an item from Barbara. Um, Randy can't be with us tonight, but he sent a PowerPoint. So uh, I have two slides to show from him. Um, we have uh, some items, uh, two videos and some photographs from Edmonton. And now we have John's item. And Chris, uh, can, you, can you just add about five minutes for the SIGs? Sure. There's two, two SIGs going on this week. I'll put you down as I'll, I'll call upon you to <laughs> start that off if that's okay. Great, Chris, uh, I've got some pictures from last night's festival. Okay, oh, great. Very good. Yeah. Okay. 
And I'll just give it another, um, I'll just wait until the uh, 25 two there, so a couple of minutes. Um, but maybe what I'll do is I'll start uh, by sharing, maybe I'll do Randy's presentation first and just put it up there so as people are joining us, they can see it. And I've got so many things open here. Here we are. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> Holy crow. So there are some shots as well. Um, so, uh, and Reg will, will provide some more um, as the ringleader of this, but this is from um, the Lopez Island uh, 4th of July celebrations last night um, that some of us viewed from uh, Cattle Point. Very pretty. Yeah, they were, it was quite a show. Um, and actually, I, I think these have turned out pretty well to actually demonstrate how, how neat they were. Um, this sequence down here actually goes through yet another, this is your red, white, and blue, although it uh, starts off blue and then it went red and then it went kind of white, as I recall. Mm -hmm. and so they, they, uh, it was quite, uh, that was quite neat. So what, what nebula are these? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a firework nebula. <laughs> it's a fireworks galaxy. Yeah. No so reason why it's actually producing fireworks nebula too, though. Yeah. I don't know if you can see it in this one. It was starting to produce quite a bit of um, smoke too, because they were so mm -hmm. much and it exploded by then. Because it was interesting looking um, where we were. We didn't have a great view toward the south, but we could see things across the strait. But it was. Um, it was quite hazy, so we were seeing, you know, kind of color bursts in the in the mist, <laughs> which looked quite neat. But uh, these were much clearer. And so I see we've got twenty five people here. So um, maybe I'll just show the second slide uh, that Randy put together. Uh, this is a, announcing next week's um, Astro Cafe. So we have. Um, uh, so we're going to have a lunar session that uh, Randy's arranged. Um, so when we have uh, at the moment, uh, hopefully two guests coming, and this is a little bit about them, uh, we'll put that uh, out in the announcement uh, on the weekend too to remind uh, members that we've got this coming up. But um, uh, it uh, looks to be very interesting. So, uh, so if you're particularly interested in doing. Uh, if things about things lunar, uh, please do join us next week. And uh, and just uh, has anybody else joined us? No, I don't think so. But there are some again some shots from the uh, firework display that uh, we could see from uh, Cattle Point. So I'll stop the share at that point, and welcome everybody to uh, Astro Cafe for July the fifth. Uh, thank you for joining us. I see we have 25 people so far. Um, so we have, uh, so I had a couple of things from Randy uh, to show the main thing about uh, what we're planning for uh, July the 12th, next week. Um, uh, on the agenda tonight, then I have uh, Barbara had found a uh, site of uh, BBC photos, uh, astrophotographs. Uh, we have some photographs from Edmonton and two videos by a day. Uh, John has been working on reprocessing um, is it Dave uh, Payne's um, one of his shots, I guess. And David would like to mention some things about the SIGs. And we've got Reg uh, also with some photographs from last evening. Uh, have I missed anybody? Okay. Well, hearing, hearing none, um, Barbara, are you available and did you want to do the sharing or did you want me to i think i think i can do it i might need some okay help from my, i have it available yeah, I... <laughs> okay. yeah, carry on <laughs> all right hi um so it, oh this is it right yeah you should be able to just share a screen and then tell it what you want to share yeah okay is that it have you, you got it? it yeah yeah there it yeah. is excellent okay so oh, you've done a you've done a PowerPoint. That's even better. I did because <laughs> I found it easier to make the pictures. Otherwise, you get words and bits of other pictures. So, um, so I think I've done this before. But the Royal Observatory at Greenwich does an astrophotography contest. Uh, this is only the thirteenth year, and they just announced a shortlist. They got forty five hundred 
entries from 75 different countries. And I don't know whether anyone here entered it, but I'm sure that some people here should. But I'm going to show you the shortlisted candidates. They haven't picked uh, who, who wins this year. Uh, who does gets to be in a display in a museum in England. And I think they actually put it online so everybody can see it. But. Okay, let's see. All right, why is it not doing this? All right, so I don't, before you asked how did they do this, what exposures, they don't give that information. So what I have, I've already got on here, but this one's of the Veil Nebula. So this is just eye candy, as Joe would say. This one's of an Aurora in Russia, it's quite, Ethereum. Yeah, that's, beautiful. that's beautiful. It is. It's a different sort of aurora. It's quite pretty. I like the context of the harbor there too. It's nice. Mm -hmm. So I can go back. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, this one's of the dolphin head nebula. I think that one's wow. quite beautiful too. Is that a southern hemisphere object? I would imagine, given that it was taken from Sri Lanka. Oh, good point, though. But I don't know that, but I would guess that anyway. The Milky Way. Some of these are more art than astronomy, but they're still quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. no, that's now, this cool. one's interesting. This one's from New Zealand, but he did it in Iceland. He took 20 images and then he put himself into it. This one's in Sydney, Australia. Now this one's kind of a strange one because he actually, rather than use a tracking device and catch that, he took thousands of frames and then just blended them to get the passage of time. I thought that was a sort of a unusual, um, way of doing it and you also get to look up somebody's nostrils. I hope it doesn't win. Uh, <laughs> moonrise over Jodrell Bank. This one's, I gather this, the timing of this was extremely difficult. Get a full moon where you got the level telescope in. Um, I thought Randy would appreciate somebody taking the effort to try and get the moon where they wanted it. The Flame Nebula. I haven't seen a picture of that before. This is my favorite. This is a spiral galaxy, but what's really kind of neat is the windswept look because it is actually interacting with another galaxy, although the other galaxy isn't in here, but I quite like that photo. That's, that's amazing. It is lovely, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Reminiscent of something you might take, John. This one is a kind of a bit of a strange one. It's uh, over Paris, the path of the full moon, and then he superimposed the young lady on the thing. So that's more, in my opinion, more art than astronomy, but. That's beautiful. These are really nice. Yeah, they are lovely, aren't they? The Pilates. Mm -hmm. Any in perspective? Saturn. They were really pleased about this because it gets the uh, hectagon in the uh, picture. You swear that Damien Peach is cheating somehow, but he's not. <laughs> <laughs> you do wonder if he's terrestrial or extraterrestrial. I'm uh, yeah, kidding. Especially he's he's if, if you, you, may, you may notice he got the outer the outer gap as yeah. well as the uh, pinky division. Yeah. Oh, that's just crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it yeah, is crazy. It's because <laughs> he's using a 20 inch Del Kirkham that's in Chile or Argentina or someplace like that. Oh, he's not using his backyard scope anymore? Oh, no. Oh. It says it's from the UK, so he's using his backyard scope for that one. Okay. 
Well, I assume it's. Uh, It'll be pre uh, what I'm year though? Would that be Saturn's really low in the sky then. <laughs> well, apparently they're supposed to have been taken in the last year, but I, you know. Some of them yeah, must I'm, be pretty big scopes. So. I'm, I'm going with South America. I'm going with cheating. <laughs> I think he's in Barbados most of the time. Please. That too, yes. Yeah, um, I wouldn't mind uh, observing from Barbados. This is a nice one with the skyline and the star trails, but they say in this you can clearly distinguish the belt of Orion. Well, maybe you can, but I can't. So somebody would have to explain to me where the belt of Orion that is so clearly distinguished in this is. Clearly not distinguished, or like it. Yeah. Okay, thank well, you. I looked uh, at it the, for a while. I, think I can't see the, it, but the three stars, the three stars to the right of the uh, tower is is the belt, I think. Oh yeah, that might. Yeah, be. I was thinking that because we got a kind of a reddish one above above it. Is that Beetlejuice? I'm pretty yeah. sure that is. So where my arrow is, is that? Yeah, where I think. I think so. Yeah. If I were to take a guess, that because they're evenly spaced. Okay. Thank you. Because I looked at it and I'm thinking, well, okay, I can't, but it says you can clearly distinguish it. <laughs> if you take the picture. The thing that confuses us is that it can be upside down compared to what yeah. we're used to seeing. Yep, yep. Oh, yep. Okay. And I think that I think that it is. Yeah, all right. Thanks. And then this one just struck me as a bit hilarious. And I, I'll leave you to read it, but Anyway, mm -hmm. he was driving. It's a nice picture of the Milky Way, but that's him driving back and forth around this hill. And then afterwards, he put himself into the hill. <laughs> I never would have thought of that. No, I wouldn't have either. <laughs> I, I suspect he was alone that night. <laughs> Cool. And this one is four different pictures of the sun rising in Shanghai. What? Given the clarity of the sky, it makes me glad not to live in Shanghai. But it's a nice picture. And it includes the bottle opener um, building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our skies might look like that after a few more forest fires. Well. Yeah, but theirs is permanent. Comet from Austria. That's really good. That's a nice one. That reminds me of high attack. High attack. Wow, look at that. And this is the last that. one. That's quite lovely. Oh, I see my F and my ROM didn't go on the same line, but other than that. That uh, is a unique perspective of the Sol Nebula. Usually people are struggling to get it all in the field of view, but he didn't even try. He just zoomed right into the interesting stuff. <laughs> and that's it. But anyway, I think they're quite lovely, but I've also seen some incredibly lovely pictures by our group. So. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever considered entering, but maybe you should. So that that's dolphin, it. Thanks, Chris. That dolphin head nebula is visible from here. It will be low. It's just south of Sirius. It's eight degrees south of Sirius. Yeah. Yeah, it's not one what, that's ever really been discussed, I don't think. So. What what constellation is it's, that? It's uh, it's in Canis Major. So oh, it's, it sharp, it's Sharpless 308. Mm -hmm. It's a Wolf Rayat. Some interesting work anyways. Um, thank you for finding that, Barbara. That's, uh, yeah, and I think you're right. I think you have, uh, you must keep an eye on that one. I think you've shown us that one in the past. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's really good. Um, okay, so if we're ready, we'll go on to Edmonton. Dave, are you uh, ready to narrate? Yeah, I think so. 
Okay, just hold on a moment and I will, this will. Okay, so the first one we have is this one. Well, this is a, a collaboration between Luca Vanzella and, uh, and Alistair Ling. And this is taken fairly close to the, short, the shallow angle of the year at the solstice where the moon just barely uh, skims the horizon as it's going up and down, so. Okay, I'll see if this will come up. So far, so good. So it'll, the moon will disappear in, from time to time behind the clouds, but you get a feel for how low it is at the latitude of 50 degrees, 53 degrees north. Going over the heart of downtown there, the flashing red sign is the CN Tower. And then there's the Stantec Tower, it's the tallest building in Edmonton now. And that's Rogers Arena straight underneath it. And you gotta watch a little bit to almost on the horizon to the, to the center right, and you'll see where the moon comes out from behind the next batch of clouds. Where is that shot from? That would, from that perspective, it's been shot from the west edge of the city, I would guess. What's get, the what's the elapsed time, Dave? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. It's quite a number of hours, I would imagine. Yeah, it, it took them quite a while. It looks like it's all night because it goes horizon yeah, to horizon. It's pretty much it's pretty much all night. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the full moon would have been up for most of. Uh, well, probably at least 10 hours, I would have thought. Well, maybe, yeah, I, I would a little less than that because yeah. of the shallow angle that it's at. I, true, true. Not quite a while. Like, and of course, the sun does the opposite. It, it, it goes under the northern horizon, very, very shallow angle. So I, I don't remember the beginning, Dave. Did, did it start at dusk? I think it started at dusk, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it would have been dusk to dawn. Yeah. Pretty For close. Edmonton, yeah. Well, dusk to dawn, which is twilight to, to dawn, daylight to twilight, <laughs> <There's> <laughs> no dark, basically. Yeah. And this is, uh, Anwar had, had, had noticed there was a lot of activity on the sun. So he went to the National Solar Observatory website and, uh, and captured this image of what the sun looks like. And uh, then you can, uh, if you go, uh, to the next one. This is his actual image that he took of the actual sunspot that he showed you the image of from the National Solar Observatory website. So you can see on the right there, he's using his uh, eight inch with his uh, solar, sorry, beta solar film. And then I think there's a close up of part of that. Of, yeah, a wider yeah. image. Of, yeah, wider. Yeah. No, it's quite a neat. Uh little clusters. Sunspots. Yeah, like to see and, some and there's, this, there's one hanging off on the left side there. So there's a little bit more activity on the sun these days than what we're used to seeing for this little while. And then? <laughs> and then Randy will like this. This is uh, Bella Beltran, Alberta Beltran that has uh, took sketches that the same night. They heard that it was going to be really good solar. So she went out the next day and took, uh, took her notebook and sketched the sunspots. Nice. She did a wonderful job on that. Yeah, I thought she did a terrific job. And then this is Marie Paulson. Uh, they did have on the 26th to 27th what they call an all sky display of uh, noctilucent clouds. So uh, Murray went out and he shot uh, a good chunk of 90 frames that he was able to get a fair number out of. Uh, with his Canon 80D and a wide angle lens. And this shows a, a time lapse of the 
noctilucent clouds and you can see how they move across the sky and how the bright part of the sky changes depending on where the sun is below the horizon, so. Okay, I'll end the uh, PowerPoint and see if we can get this to work here. So you can see how the wispy uh, upper, upper, very upper atmosphere clouds are moving around. It's not, they're not static at all. And of course, what you're seeing there is the sun actually going down below the western, northwestern horizon. So. So if that one's quite short, we'll just run through it again. Yeah. That's how it's really neat with the stars appearing as, as the sun. Yes. <laughs> That's, or we lose that light. Up. It's still midnight twilight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was pretty late, wasn't it? Yeah. There you go. Anyways, thank you very much. I think, um, I don't know if there are any comments about that, but otherwise, uh, John, are you um, ready? Uh, yeah, I can, I can do it. Uh, okay, so I need to take this one, this one, and this one. This thing's in the way, no wonder, just a second. Okay, so uh, Dave can maybe tell you about getting this. This is his data. Uh, I reprocessed it, but the hard work was done by Dave putting together a wonderful observatory setup and getting incredibly good data that made it fairly easy to get a nice image out of it. So Dave, go ahead. Oh, I'm just, um, well, that's the, the ring nebula right in the middle. I, um, I've, I've looked at it uh, quite well. It was just on a CDK, a plane wave CDK 12 and a half, um, taken with an ASI 6200. And uh, I, I just, um, you know, just made sure all my ducks were in a row and that, that I was, uh, had a good night, um, well aligned. And, uh, uh, I think it was three nights, one night, uh, the LRGB was taken and then two nights of, uh, narrow band, um, hydrogen alpha, uh, O3 and S2. And I just uh, um, I just uh, compiled them. Um, what did I do? I uh, denoised them, uh, calibrated them, and uh, then aligned them and uh, weighted them and and. Uh, made some master light frames for each one of the filters. And uh, I was struggling a little bit um, trying to process it um, because the nebula is so bright relative to all the, the, the rest of the objects in the star. And if you'll notice just to the northwest or up, uh, I guess it's not northwest necessarily, but yeah, right there, there's a, there's a galaxy. So the, the part I was I was struggling with is trying to get the details in the ring nebula at the same time balancing the brightness so that that galaxy wasn't lost at the same time. So I, I thought, well, and I did as best I could and I'm just learning the processing side. So I thought I'd put it out there. Um, here's, here's the master light frames. Who 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 can uh, who can show me how to or who can do better than me? <laughs> which which uh, John certainly certainly did. Um, 
so so that's the only part I I took in this. It's it's really John did the did the the hard work on it. So I just I'm, I'm dying to find out what John did. It, 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 he did a really okay. nice job of balancing here. So I just love it. I'll be happy to show you what I did when we in in the sig. At any rate, I I just want to say the data was so beautiful and. What's nice about it, from my point of view, is that you could you could get the star colors out beautifully, mm. and uh, the nebula is quite lovely in the middle of that star field. What I do want to show, though, is this is what happens when I just processed the narrow band by itself. Mm. This is three narrow band filters. That's H alpha, O three, and S two, and I used my own version of a palette that gives you roughly the right, the colors that, that, you know, a color camera would see. And then I put that in place of what you saw before in the middle. The difference is that this is just, it's a, it sharpens up the nebula just a little bit. I, whether it's better or not is a question of the eye. That's, that's the original one you saw before. And this is the different one. Well, I could, I can definitely see more detail in the nebula itself. Mm -hmm. This one. So it's it's interesting. Anyway, that that unless you have anything else you want to say about it, but Dave, I would I would just slightly refute about who did the hard work. It's not <laughs> easy, not easy to get good data like this, and and uh, it was a pleasure to work with it. And just to translate, just to translate for everybody, good data means round stars and good star colors and good detail. And you got all of them here. Yep. Yeah, I really yeah. like the little carbon star. Yeah, you Half, saw that, did you? Halfway between the ring and the bottom right corner. Yeah. There's just a yeah. deep red star. Yeah, there oh, yeah. It's next to it's a there. pair. Right, right there. Hmm. Yeah, it yeah. pops right out. Oh, wow. Yeah, nicely done, you guys. Okay. Teamwork. <laughs> yeah, the teamwork I think is uh, pretty apparent, but I just wanted to point out with M57, as Dave mentioned, it was it's usually so bright. Well, it is bright. Um, getting as much wispy detail in in the ring section, the blue and the red section, is uh, significantly difficult. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. And it's there. <laughs> <laughs> thanks john for doing that thanks dave <laughs> get his bill in the mail <laughs> hope i can afford it <laughs> very good um david sigs <laughs> yes uh so we have two two sigs uh for this week um uh the beginner sig is actually tomorrow night and we're going to be talking a little bit about one of our members' uh, pursuit for finding, a, I guess, a modestly good go-to system. Um, I think I will kind of augment it somewhat by uh, maybe suggesting some uh, alternatives to that as well. Um, I think I've probably talked about kind of like push-to systems, which might be beneficial to some people, especially if you get a... Um, maybe an older telescope and you don't want to go all the way to go to, uh, there's some other alternatives. Um, I think I might, if I have some time, I also might talk about my, my foray into uh, variable star observing. Uh, I think I mentioned last week that I had taken a step back. Uh, I was originally going to jump right into uh, digital photometry, but uh, I had a bit of a, uh, an epiphany about wanting to not jump all the way over to that side right away. So uh, I decided to do uh, a visual variable. And in fact, I just halfway through my variable uh, star visual course uh, at the AAVSO. So I'm right in the middle of that right now. Uh, I developed um, an observer's profile for my site and uh, profiled all my equipment uh, in terms of the fields of view and uh, also, I'm right in the middle of choosing targets now, so I have to kind of make a bit of a commitment to 
observing these things over time. Um, it is um, a time domain type of activity. So uh, you will be kind of sort of monitoring variables and uh, over time. So a lot of these are uh, very short period and but there's also long period variables as well. Uh, in the fall, when uh, some of the uh, short period ones are going to be, I'm going to try some of the classics like Al Algol and uh, observe them. Um, they have very short periods, like like two days. Uh, so you can make a you know probably several uh, kind of uh, estimates uh, through the evening and maybe the next evening do the same and capture a full cycle. So uh, yeah, I'll just briefly talk about that. Uh, I think it might be one of those activities that we can try if we're trying to sort of bridge visual versus um, kind of di digital seeing uh, in, in what we do. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about that. And then maybe uh, after a, a couple of months, I'll, I'll share with you the, the full story of the visual and then the uh, photometric journey. Uh, on Thursday, uh, we're gonna have another session of uh, the EAA group. Uh, we've been kind of, um, uh, kind of dampened by the, the shortage of hours, but I, I can see that Brock and Dave has still been working really hard at uh, capturing materials. So uh, uh, I will continue to use that material until we can get um, uh, some time to do some uh, more literal EAA. So yeah, if anybody's uh, interested in those, uh, those are the two sessions. Uh, if you're not already uh, belonging to the group and you're interested, just let me know and I'll, I'll drop your ID into the, into the, uh, the distribution for those. Um, any questions? Uh, if there are no questions, uh, that's it. It's great. Oh, oh, uh, uh, a word to Chris. Uh, last week we were talking about the state of uh, computing equipment on the Hubble. So I, I did uh, purchase a Haynes manual. Uh, I don't say I'm a qualified mechanic for the Hubble now, but I got more information about the guts of it. Uh, but I did, I did look at the, basically the change log for the computing equipment. And uh, they started off with a number of uh, 386s. Um, they had uh, at least, I think three 386 processors on the main unit. I think it's called a, a DF224 custom, of course. Um, and then their one big upgrade that they did was uh, they upgraded to a 486, I think with some additional memory. Now we may laugh at uh, some of these uh, specifications, but uh, they were very preoccupied by having processors that would be able to sustain radiation out in space. So that's one of the reasons why the equipment seems uh, subpar to us. Anyways, that's just a little note for Chris. Yes, uh, yes, and that, that's right. And, and also, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the software they're using has been uh, through much more debugging than, uh, than uh, soft, a lot of the software we know and love. So when they, when they upgrade it, that is a big, big, big deal. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, just, just while we're on that topic, uh, uh, um, I, I've just put something on the chat, uh, which uh, which is actually quite a good talk uh, uh, about the, the the problems on Hubble. I um, I thought it was one of the better things I, I've seen on this. So. Uh, uh, Eric, Eric Briggs dug this up. Uh, so, uh, um, so I think it's, I think that's about nine or 10 minutes, that thing, but it's, it's worth a look if you're interested in what's going on. And, uh, um, I think there might've been, there might've been one, one update since then. Um, but, uh, is that about, about current activity, Chris? Yes. Oh, with it right now. Okay. That's right. Uh, and just just kind of a, an explanation of, of, of what's going on. The, 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 this fellow is a bit more familiar with the with the guts of, of things than, a, than I am. So uh, it's it's worth a look. I think it's going to take uh, you know 
perhaps uh, you know another week or two before they they uh, they sort this out. So anyway, we Thanks. shall see. David, are you going to send them some advice? I don't know. I I, I haven't read the last chapter yet. <laughs> you may it's, just, it's, you it's, may probably just the, it's probably the critical chapter. Can they just send new software or firmware up? <laughs> I don't. I don't know the answer to that question. I, I. I. I suppose they can transmit it. That's not a problem. They have. Yeah. No. They. Yeah. They. They. They do software updates, and and you know those those, those slides I was showing last week. You know that rig with all those old nineteen eighties monitors. That's that's where they 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 test that stuff before they actually upload it. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's actually quite an, a neat uh, uh, device. Actually, it's a it, it's obviously custom made, but uh, when you look at it, it's it's quite a rigorous uh, metal cage, and they have all these modules like they, like the processors are sitting on special daughter boards, and then the memory, like everything, seems to be kind of like it's not a traditional motherboard, right? Uh, they've made everything really, I guess, rugged, I guess, and and immune from radiation. But the real big cost was using people to put it up there. Mm. I remember reading an essay probably about 15 years ago, and he was breaking down the numbers. And if they had not used people to put it up there and all that it cost to put people into space, they could have built about 10 Hubbles and just have them sitting, waiting. So they'd probably only be on number three, right? And they could send it up with the best computers and have keep updating to relaunch Hubble's mm. if they just sent them up on a rocket. Yeah, I, I, I guess one might have to rethink this. Like, I, I'm just trying to think about uh, the traditional software industry and how, how far we've come uh, from like really protracted updates to very <laughs> rapid develop now, rapid development now. Like, uh, you've uh, mostly we've probably already noticed how, how rapid the updates are for like Windows or any piece of software now. Uh, people are doing continuous updates now. It's quite a different strategy. We're up, we're up to Windows 11 now. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the budget thing around Hubble is quite an interesting discussion. But the, the cost of the, those servicing missions was basically not charged to the astrophysics budget of NASA, but was uh, part of the, uh, the, the human space budget. So it's, yeah, you, you can really get into the weeds about where you can go with that money because I, I think you could make the argument because the budgeting is going that way, that that money would not be there if they said, well, let's, Let's not send astronauts up there, but let's build uh, ten Hubbles and just replace them when we want to. You know, and there there was a lot of discussion earlier on. You know, like uh, about let's bring Hubble back to Earth to refurbish. Um, and basically, uh, Ed Weiler, who was you know, in in kind of a way, Mr. Hubble realized, you know. You bring it down, you give them a hell of an excuse not to put it back up again, and uh, and I think that was that was a that was a, a wise judgment. But you notice that that there really hasn't been another spacecraft that's been set up like like Hubble. It's so dependent on on these these repairs and things like that because that was a a huge amount of money. Uh, but uh, anyway. As long as you don't make the same error 10 times. <laughs> That's right. No guarantee of that. <laughs> well, they would have refigured the mirror. Yeah. Corrective lenses. <laughs> Very neat. Okay, well, thanks uh, for sharing that information and the update on the Hubble. And yeah, if you could keep us posted as the uh, as information comes in, that would be great too, Chris. Um, Reg, are you uh, available to share? Give it a try. Yeah. 
Can anybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see your, yeah, you're ready to start the play. Yeah, play. That's good. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, for some time now, uh, a number of uh, rascals have been going down to Cattle Point on July 4th and pointing our telescopes towards um, Lopez Island where they have one of the largest July 4th fireworks displays in uh, Washington state. And um, we decided to change this to the Henrietta Levitt Memorial Horizon Watch because uh, she, her birthday was July 4th. And when I first discovered it, uh, she would have been 150 years old. So we're still doing that. Um, the, the interesting thing about this is that uh, the, the flash precedes the sound by quite a bit. And so um, I've got a map here and uh, this is uh, Cattle Point here. This is uh, San Juan Island, and this is Lopez Island, and there's a big bay in here called Fisherman's Bay. And somewhere in here is where they launch all of the fireworks. There's also a firework uh, show that starts uh, at Friday Harbor. It usually starts around 10 after 10, and the Lopez Island show starts uh, right on the dot at uh, 10.30. So, the distance uh, between Cattle Point and Fisherman's Bay on Lopez Island is 28 kilometers. And uh, so to figure out the speed of sound, uh, we have uh, Environment Canada has a weather station located on the east side of Discovery Island here. And uh, their temperature was 13 degrees Celsius. Well, that's fairly close to the uh, temperature of 15 degrees uh, that the speed of sound is at, which at that temperature at sea level pressure is about um, 1,228 kilometers per hour. And so you can uh, calculate uh, the time for the sound to reach Cattle Point uh, after the flash, just be to, by dividing the speed, uh, the distance by the speed and converting it from hours to minutes. And it turns out to be about 82 seconds uh, for the sound to go from, from uh, Fisherman's Bay to Cattle Point. And so after the fireworks show is over, you still get muffled booms for about four, 82 seconds. It's kind of a neat thing. Um, so we, there was about five of us out there uh, this year and I set up a little, um, uh, 61 millimeter uh, scope with my um, uh, Canon T3i on it. And normally when I focus the Canon, I, I pick a bright star like Vega and I zoom in on it and I tweak the uh, uh, focus so I minimize the dot. Um, but in attempting to focus on the fireworks, uh, they didn't hang around uh, very long. And so, so there'd be little fleeting flashes and I'd try and focus it. So I'm gonna show you some pictures, which I'm quite ashamed to say are, are poorly, quite poorly focused at this time. But next year, if uh, it was dark enough in time, I would focus on a star instead. So just uh, a cautionary tale there, so. Here's the beginning. So I, I, I took uh, about 300 pictures and don't panic. I'm not gonna show you all. I'm just gonna show, the, show you a few of these things. These are kind of a sequence coming out. I think they were blurry anyway because of the atmospheric turbulence. Like I wasn't able to focus at all in my telescope just cause we were looking through so much atmosphere. Yeah, that's right. Wow, you, Good point. you made me feel a lot better there, um, uh, Nathan. Thanks very much for that. You, so you could, you could see that so in binocular in my binoculars. That it was quite blurry near the horizon. There was a lot of turbulence. Okay, so there you go. So I don't feel so ashamed. Uh, that's good. So this is uh, one of them. This is kind of a neat one here, where you can see the uh, stars, uh, or the the different things. It's almost like uh, the effect you get from some of the um, uh, 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 shots that they show on space where you have exploding uh, galaxies and, and uh, dipoles uh, of uh, gases or something. 
ex ex escaping from the, the core of a, of a galaxy and this sort of stuff. Um, and then just one other here. You know, if they look um, that much like dipole galaxies, could you take a picture of one and then submit it to the Explore the Universe catalog and have it count? <laughs> Great. That's an excellent idea. <laughs> I'll put your name on it. So I'll just uh, stop it there. And um, but before I, I relinquish the mic, I would like to just say that uh, um, the, the uh, nights are getting longer and uh, the COVID restrictions are gradually retreating. And so we've been working fairly hard up at the VCO. Uh, there's been uh, two groups up there. One, we have, um, as you know, we have both a ref reflector and a refractor on the Paramount Drive. And uh, the idea was that we were going to use a very high quality focuser made by Feather Touch uh, that we had acquired for the older scope and put it on the, um, uh, the Takahashi refractor. But uh, one of the problems we have is that the uh, aluminum tube and the aluminum collar that holds the existing focuser are jammed and we cannot uh, remove them without possibly destroying the telescope. So we're, we're doing an agonizing appraisal of our reappraisal of our options now. But the other focuser works quite well. Uh, we could upgrade it and have a, a two-speed focuser on there that's also made by Feather Touch, but it would be unfortunate if we had to do that. So that's one thing that we've been working on. And I guess the team of uh, Gary, uh, John, and David and I have been up there uh, uh, during the daylight hours um, working on that. And then the other uh, mission we have right now is because we have the new tube, uh, uh, the, co the combination of tubes, we had to change our balance of our telescope. And what the Paramount scope has is a, a thing called a T-point model. And uh, what that uh, is useful for is uh, accurately positioning the uh, telescope uh, uh, and pointing it in the sky uh, as a, a really well coordinated robot. And in order to uh, refine our pointing model, we are going to be taking about 250 uh, uh, kind of samples of the sky. And the way it works is that we take a photograph. Uh, we plate solve it, meaning that we submit it to a, a database and it finds out where the exact centroid of the center of that picture is. And it logs it into the uh, computer so we know what the uh, coordinates are in that. And we build a statistical model on this. And it sounds like it's a pretty easy thing. All you have to do is set it up, push the button, and uh, then it'll start merrily uh, clicking away at these things. And, but we, we haven't actually experienced that yet. And uh, Gary, I don't know if you want to share our adventures, but uh, uh, we've been up there two nights so far with um, uh, uh, Dan Posey, Gary Sedan. Brock was up for one night, and uh, we were up there until about 1.30 in the morning one night trying to get in this thing to work. Um, and so we've had some, a few challenges where we're very close to getting it fixed up. So the scope will probably point itself quite well soon. But Gary, did you want to add any comments to that? Yeah, for sure. Um, it may sound easy like um, it was just said, but it turns out for, if you have a raw scope that is, you don't know really where it's pointing at all, actually getting it to figure out where it's pointing is really, really tough. I've, I've run into this many times. So we're sitting. You have to either use you have to either use the full moon to actually uh, get this, you know, so you can kind of steer to where the light is and, and get the moon get get the scope pointing at it, or a really bright star. Now we didn't have a we didn't have a full moon, so we spent a, I'd say about an hour trying to find get a bright star in the telescope. And believe it or not, you can look up there and there's a bright star, and you point the scope at it and you just can't find it. So it's a tough thing. So good news is we finally did find it and we said to the telescope, this is this star. And as soon as the scope knows one star, then you can start doing plate solving because plate solving doesn't work too well until you at least tell it 
close to where you think you are. And as soon as we could do that, then we're off to the races. So uh, we got about, I think, close to 50, just about 50 samples of stars in the sky done. So this telescope right now is usable. We could actually slap the camera on there and start take, start gathering photons. But we do need to refine the T-point model because it's only part of the sky. And if you think of what we're trying to do here, the sky, as the telescope moves around the sky, because of flexure in the different parts of the scope, it really isn't the way you see it because the scope's moving all the time. So you're, you're making a model that corrects for where the scope thinks it is. So we have to do pretty well the whole sky in order for it to work well over the sky, over the whole sky. And we'll be doing that very soon. But the hard work, hard work has been done. And speaking of hard work, I should mention that we all, four of us, Brock, Reg, myself, and Dan, were, were balancing the scope and moving things around, all physically distanced, of course, and it worked <laughs> out very, very well. It, it's a, it's a kick-ass so, system, and we should be very, very pleased with it. So, so I have a, a couple of comments and a, and a question. Yeah, you're, you're right. The T-point is necessary to account for a number of things, the lack of orthogonality in the axes and... Uh, and any flexure. So if you change major loading on the scope or how balanced as it is, it'll change that flexure and the T-point will take care of that. The one thing I wasn't sure if T-point will do is if, if it will deal with refraction when you get near the horizon. Yes, it does because it's actually Good. recording the position of the stars at the horizon. Of yeah. course, you never image below about 30 degrees anyhow, so it's not that big of an effect. Um, but actually, when you do change anything on the scope, you should really do another T-point because it changes the way things flex. Yeah. So it's a, it's a bit of a fussy thing, but you only have to do it once. And once you get it all set up and tuned up, you can do about 250 points in just over an hour. And it's a thing of beauty to watch a little scope zipping around and taking pictures and figuring out what's going on and adding it all up. And presto change, you at the end of it all, you have a very nice model of what the sky looks, at to the, looks like to the telescope. So we're very, very close to getting that all done. Good. Yeah, we, we abandoned our mission uh, one night. Uh, we were smothered with cloud and that, that uh, did us in. But we did have a little bit of a clear spot. But you, you raise a good point, Dave, about the refraction. And one of the inputs we do when we're doing the T-point is giving it the temperature, the surface temperature. Right. And it factors that in there for uh, calculating a refraction model. Good stuff. And the other thing is, once you uh, have it all in there, it tells you how to adjust your polar alignment to uh, yeah. refine your polar alignment as well. Yeah, so, with with that with that mount, it it's pretty good. It just tells you even how many fractions of a turn to make on each adjustment. Yeah. <laughs> pretty sweet, pretty sweet. We're, it turns out we're pretty good. We're just about polar aligned perfectly, but we'll we'll refine that more once we get all once we get a chance to get up there. By the way, there's several different polar alignments. We can have that kind of discussion with you technical geeks like myself someday over a beer. So the, um, the, the, the one technical thing I might add is to get the focuser, a couple of flexible pipe wrenches to get we, your focuser apart. They tried that. They tried that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, John, John, who actually tried the, who, who actually tried those wrenches? You're, you're muted. So is it possibly oxidized? Uh, John, John, you're muted. No, it's it's actually aluminum on aluminum, and it's a known problem. They they actually paint the inside surfaces of the threads, but uh, this is the scope's a few years old, and it's uh, it's locked for whatever reason. I always use. Uh, we, reason. we can work we can work around it by just spending a little a, penetrating another three hundred dollars. Yeah, right. <laughs> just a little penetrating oil on the threads might not. Yeah, hurt. I was saying maybe maybe we should saw it off. But anyway, no, we'll we'll use it the way it is. It's yeah. fine. What about heat yeah. and cold? Try that. Too. that. Uh, they're you the same metal. Uh, that I I brought a bag of peas and put it on the inside of the uh, tube and by the collar. And <laughs> we had strap wrenches and uh, oh. things like that, and we put in penetrating oil and yeah. stuff like that. So we. We have done some things and we talked to the technicians at uh, Starlight Industries who make them. And uh, this is not a, a, a rare problem. If you go on uh, cloudy nights, there's all sorts of people who've had problems with this. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that the cure might be worse than the, uh, 
the disease. So we might just keep with what we have and, and do a, something else rather than radical surgery. Yeah. So is it the feather touch that's attached to something else? Is that what the problem is? No, the uh, feather touch, uh, we have to remove the existing focuser that comes with the Takahashi telescope. Right. And we have the adapter to put the feather touch okay. on it. But right. uh, unfortunately, uh, we're at a bit of a... So the, the focuser that's on the scope is what's stuck. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah that's right, Bill. Don't screw it. Yeah, it, 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 it's actually, likely... actually, technically, the focuser came off. There's two pieces. It's the final piece that won't come off. So it's still usable. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's likely that with the tight tolerances and if they didn't treat those threads when they screwed it in, that there's some galling that happens when you threw it in and then you're not going to get that out of there. Well, it, it is aluminum on aluminum and there's yep. probably some paint involved as well. Yeah, so we, you, we yeah, have you a, can our, differential temperature that they, they have the same expansion coefficient. So I always did the, I always put the O-ring grease on my threads. Yeah. In those things. Yep. We Just a little Vaseline, the answer to that stuff. Particularly if the tall is right. Yeah. yeah. One final thing we're going to be doing pretty soon is uh, servicing the teeth, the Paramount mount, the, the worm mm -hmm. gears and stuff. I do that every year with my old, really, really old one, and it's still working fine. So we're going to do that with the one up here. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, that's all for me, uh, Chris. Yeah. Well, thank you, Reg, and thanks for the update about the VCO. And uh, uh, I don't know if we have anything else this evening, but I just um, mentioned that there is a star party on Saturday night. Um, so have a look at the, uh, what is it, observatoryhill.org if you are interested in that. Um, and a reminder that next Monday night, uh, Randy has uh, put together a uh, show about the moon. <laughs> Um, at this location. So uh, we'll have a, a, a themed night on uh, July the 12th. And I don't know if anybody else has anything. Um, Actually, uh, Chris, I do have one more thing. Uh, one of the, the things on Reg's slide prompted me to remember this thing that I discovered today. Um, so uh, Reg mentioned uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt and uh, of course, uh, if you've read uh, Davis Abel's book, uh, Glass Universe, you'll understand what that's about. Uh, but anyways, I, uh, I chanced on this while I was doing some research for my variable star work. And uh, I, I hadn't realized, or I didn't know, or maybe I didn't really know, that they had actually scanned all the plates mm. uh, or most of the plates uh, from the Harvard collection. So I'm just gonna throw, um, just maybe I just share my screen here and I'll show you. So this is the uh, project called Dash and they actually had volunteers scan the original plates. Now, you might wonder why you would want to do this, but it becomes quite apparent when you start to study variable stars that it's really an exercise in uh, analyzing data over time. So it is a time domain type of analysis. So the fact that they have a hundred years of data from these plates is a great thing because anything that we see today, we might be able to map back to things that were available on the photographic plates. So I actually haven't done this yet, but apparently you can ask by object uh, different uh, parts of the sky. And it comes back either in uh, FITS or JPEG format, so you, you can specify which. But then you can actually see things like, uh, like the original Andromeda galaxy, which actually at the time was called the Andromeda Nebula. Anyways, I'll just drop in the, um, drop in the URL and then you can, you can have a quick look. Cool. Yeah, I also have an announcement to make, and I've just dropped that into chat. Um, the UVic is having a uh, UVic uh, Observatory is having their weekly 
I guess it's weekly now or thereabouts. Anyway, it's happening this Wednesday, an open house, uh, observatory open house. Um, they're inviting everyone to join them for an astro history session. Uh, astronomy is one of the oldest sciences and almost every world culture has its own take on the science and mythology of the stars. Most of us are taught astro history from Roman Greek perspective. So they will be exploring how some of the less often talked about cultures from every continent have studied the sky through history. So that's available this Wednesday. And uh, the info's in the chat. Thank you uh, both for that. Yes, I think Randy had mentioned the uh, UVic Observatory, but wasn't on his slide. So I had uh, forgotten about it. So thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, so anybody else have anything for this evening? Well, if not, I guess we will adjourn. Um, and so thank you very much for joining us this evening. And uh, reminder, we'll be back uh, uh, every Monday, except those that are set holidays. So um, uh, that will be the first Monday in August. We will not be here, but otherwise we are planning to be here until we could resume the uh, in-person uh, cafes. And if you were here at the beginning, we are um, starting to explore what that might happen and when that might happen, but we will uh, rest assured, we'll continue with Zoom in the interim. And uh, I don't see us changing format uh, for uh, anytime soon, just put it that way, because uh, we'll have to determine what's happening. Um, uh, with the, uh, you know, what the spaces that we've been using and are they still available, etc. cetera. So, um, so please continue to join us. And uh, if, uh, if that's it, we'll see everyone next week. Okay. okay. So thanks again. Thanks, Fred. <laughs> Bye.